Okay. So, uh, welcome, welcome everyone to our fifth session of the uh, Back to the Cell study course. Um, in this um, in this course, at least to start anyway, we're going to be taking a uh, look through the Getty. Uh, the point being to um, look at and point out some things which um, are important for our training on the cell, but sometimes don't actually make it to the cell floor. And sometimes we see things on the cell floor that come from a place in the manuscripts that isn't obvious. And so we're um, we're taking a look at all those things as well as to you know, chart the manuscript, under, you know, familiarize ourselves with it a little bit, um, and uh, yeah, give us an opportunity to ask some questions about it and and all that sort of thing. Um, I am leading these sessions, so obviously you're going to get my view uh, on the Getty, um, and uh, it's important to know that nothing is the case just because I said it. We want you to be persuaded by the same evidence that we're persuaded by, because this, of course, is uh, scholarship. Um, one of the cool things about our martial art is that it is based um, in, uh, is founded in scholarship, scholarly work, both on the page and on the floor. Um, so it's important that, you know, we all have a scholarly attitude and approach to the study of it. All right. Um, last session, we stopped with the, um, we stopped at the first Remedy Master of Dagger in the Getty. And we took a look at the Bastono Cello section, and we took a look at the first or the three introductory pages of the dagger section: the five postas, the senyo page, and uh, the four masters of dagger. Um, as a quick summary of yesterday, uh, of last class, although I suppose we have these on video now, so isn't isn't that uh, isn't that useful? Um, <laughs> the five posters, basically, um, we were talking about this just before we started. Um, we have, we have these five, we have these five posters that of course found every major section of Fury, a set of posters rather. We have single, we have doubled without the dagger, we have doubled with the dagger, we have crossed without the dagger, and we have doubled and crossed with the dagger. Okay. Um, the next page we have is the um, dagger senyo page so it has the f uh, four strikes of the dagger fendente mandrito reversi and sotani and it also has some uh, prefatory comments about the dagger what it's like what its nature is and then finally we have the um f the page of the four masters of dagger and these masters show in the flesh some concepts that fiore has talked about Many, uh, a bunch of times already it will a whole lot more um, but we haven't actually seen them personified yet as very fiori likes to do and these concepts are disarms breaks keys and throws so these are the four things that we're going to be doing all the time in dagger and uh notable in the text is uh his insistence that this is uh abrazare so though we're doing you know, dagger, as it were, whatever that means. Though, though we're fighting with the dagger, what we're doing is we're doing abrazare, and there happens to be a dagger involved. Um, and as it happens, uh, though, you know, with every weapon, the nature of the weapon will inflict a character onto the fight. We are always doing abrazare uh, underneath, right? Um, and we find that out whenever we end up coming to grips with any weapon system whatsoever, all of a sudden, Abrazar is there uh, full bore. So, uh, great that Fiore started with it, and not only did he start the book with it, but he underscored to us that it underpins everything. So we're in no confusion or doubt there. Um, so here we are. We're um, starting, the, starting this big journey into the dagger section now. Um, as a quick reminder, so how this dagger section seems to be organized is it has three prefatory pages setting us up for a whole lot of plays the page of the five posters the senyo page and the four masters and then we have nine remedy masters so each remedy master begins with a uh, with the remedy master so in this case today we're going to be looking principally at the first remedy master of dagger and so the how, how this works in Dagger, and I stress in Dagger, is the first Remedy Master will make a cover. 
against an attack. Subsequently, every scholar that follows from that remedy master will be performing some kind of move, some action, following the cover. And every crown and gartered figure following after the remedy master, they will be performing some kind of counteraction against the cover, specifically the cover. Okay. Um, and pretty ubiquitously, that's how the dagger section is organized. Um, we can see all of the initial covers here just by looking at them. The first remedy master, which we believe is against a Mendrito. The second remedy master, which we believe is against a Fendente. Although he says it can be um, against Mendrito or uh, a Reversi as well. Um, or, or Satani, I suppose. Um, the third remedy master, which is against a Reverso attack. The fourth remedy master, which is again against a Fendente. This one is specifically a Fendente, whereas this one can play on either side. The fifth Remedy Master, which is against a Collar Grab. And circumstantially, we talked about transitionary sections yeah, uh, last week. We talked about how the Bastono Cello and the um, Sword and Dagger section and the Mixed Weapon sections in Fiore and a few others. There seems to be what you, know, what you could read as transition sections between larger topics, grappling, dagger, sword, uh, you know, armor, whatever. This um, collar grab remedy master is the last remedy master who does not have a dagger. So one, two, three, four, five, these first five remedy masters do not themselves have a dagger. What follows is the sixth, seventh, and eighth remedy master, all of whom have daggers. And then the ninth remedy master bringing up the rear, who um, also do, who doesn't have a dagger circumstantially. Um, so it's interesting that this ninth master is here. The, this eighth master here, the eighth master in the Getty, is uh, I believe is unique to the Getty. So the the Pizani Dossi only has eight remedy masters. So it has I believe it has first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh and then ninth, according to the Getty. So it, I don't think it has the uh, the eighth, but let me just um, make sure I didn't just lie to you. Uh, that's correct. Okay, great. So yeah, the Paris, uh, yeah, the Paris has this one, which is very curious. It's an, another interesting departure from its similarity to the uh, to the PD, but we, anyways, we won't get into that. So um, yeah, so the Getty, the Getty dagger section, we got one, two, three, four, five, six masters six army masters without a dagger and then three with a dagger okay um so um all right so let's just launch um let's just launch into it um all right so here we go we're going to start at the first remedy master now i'm going to make one um i gave a lot of speeches uh, kind of like broad topical you know overviews last time i'm we're not going to do that today we've got a lot of speci specifics to get into and i'm sure some some great questions will be asked and, and whatever i'm going to see some fun some funky stuff but i'm going to make one broad comment before i start and that's this um the again the reason why in my opinion anyway the reason why dagger is so critical uh, uh, an exercise to learn to become a good fencer. And as, as, as Fiore says in the dagger section uh, in the Senyo page here, um, if you know my deceptions in my art, you will be skilled at every subtlety of the art of arms. So what I understand that to mean is um, a bunch of things, right? You need to know your, you need to have your audacia. You need to know when it's time to go all in right um you need to know your moment you need to be confident um you know sure of your defenses etc cetera, etc cetera. but part of being in the right place and doing the right thing at the right time part of that is you know the art of sensitivity and and um understanding through touch through the certainty of touch what your opponent is doing and this is the skill that makes an expert fencer an expert fencer. Um, far too often, fencing has this sort of strange, you know, mystical 
uh, reputation where, you know, it seems like, you know, well, let me put it this way. Sometimes, fen sometimes fencers seem like they can see things before they happen. And really skilled fencers seem like they can read you, right? While a lot of that is true in that you can read some things and tell some things without contact with your enemy. None of those things are really worth betting your life on. Or very few, right? The best things to bet your life on are the things which you know most for certain right most for certain and in fencing the feelings you get through the sword are the most certain things to bet your life on so the best masterful fencers they not only can they read you well out of the engagement but while the engagement is going on almost unbelievably they can feel through through the chaos of what's going on they can feel what you're doing make a tactical and correct judgment about how to move themselves and then move themselves all in the right time such that they are where they need to be to make that kill make that defense etc right and this is something that cut that only only arrives through um tons of training and a little luck and this is the every subtlety of art of arms i think that fiora is talking about because dagger requires that as well with dagger, you need to be able to feel what your opponent is doing to make the correct judgment almost instantly as soon as you feel it. Because that's the time situation you have when you're defending against dagger. You have no time. You have no time whatsoever. So you have to make the right judgment and you have to make it now, as soon as you make your as soon as you get your feeling. But the nature of dagger is that you do get into contact right away. Right? He has to come at you. He, I mean, he's trying to murder you, right? We we, we, we we went over this as the context. If he's trying to murder you, he's not going to be stalking you and like giving you a chance to run away, trying to draw you out to get you to jump on him if he has a dagger and you don't. No, no, he's trying to murder you. You're making a defense. He's coming to you. So if you can make the cover, you have a chance. And so why we think, or one reason... Um, that, that uh, Fury's dagger might be organized by the covers, okay, is because with all of these attacks, these four attacks of the dagger, once you've made the cover and your opponent reacts to the fact of the cover, then you have a number of moves and oppor opportunities that you can do, okay? And at Emma, we break this down into three different energies at the at the moment of the cover okay so at the moment of the cover once you've getting uh once you've begun the engagement you've got contact the enemy can either remain there for the moment immediately pull their the dagger back in that moment or push forward because they had a lot of energy on that attack and their body was following through with it too so stay, pull, uh, push forward and pull back. Those are the three possible broad category energies that the Remedy Master is going to feel after they make the cover. And uh, it's possible to categorize every one of these moves that we're going to see, not only by what they are, disarm, break, key throw, whatever, but by the energy that they most likely come from. And this is important to keep in mind when you study the dagger because it's the di it's simply the difference between understanding the dagger and not. Because if you think that the moves, these moves of the dagger are just a matter of doing them, like if somebody attacks you with a reversey, oh, I'm going to do that move, right? You're wrong. Because there are lots of circumstances where certain moves and actions are not ideal, and other ones are. And the only way to know is to sense it. So you don't get the freedom to just choose whatever the hell you want to do. You have to do the best thing. And really, this is the same thing in fencing too. It's just a little less obvious. But Dagger makes it really clear. So for all you want to be scholars out there, and you can say that I say, you know, that Aaron says this, I really do believe this. The difference between 
a you know a B plus scholar test and an A plus scholar test is seeing a scholar candidate who understands that these defenses and the actions of the dagger uh, require specific energies. And that knowledge, that recognition of sensitivity will carry on through to the sword and, and to grappling and it. That shows that you, you, you're starting to get it. Um, so I'm going to try and make that clear as well as we go through. All right, that's it. Now let's get into the plays. First Remedy Master. Folio 10 VA. Uh, Alex K, would you like to read the text? I'm the first master called Remedy. Remedy is an antidote against your opponent's attacks, together with the ability to strike him. Here is the absolute best thing I can do. Make me drop your dagger by turning my hand to the left. Okay. Um, oh, I didn't say this yet today, but I, I'll say it again. If you have any questions about anything at any time, please do interrupt or type it in the chat. Otherwise, I'll just keep plugging along. But please do ask any questions that you have. All right. So um, the first remedy master, defense against the uh, Mandrito. Okay. Why is it a defense against the Mandrito? Because this defense is weak against the Fendente. The Fendente comes straight. I should bring up the Segno because we're going to refer to that probably a bunch. The Fendente attack comes straight down. Okay. It has the full weight of gravity behind it. It's a very powerful attack. Stretching your left hand out, unsupported against that attack is... Um, very weak, not least because you, you have to get under it. And in order to get under it, if the Fendente is coming down the center, if it's a true Fendente, then your left hand is going to have to cross your center line, essentially, right? And that's terrible, okay? So um, this can, of course, in desperation, be done against the Fendente. Any, you know, lots of things can be done in desperation. But that's not what we th think Fury is doing here. We think this Remedy Master is against the Mandrito attack, which is coming in at an angle on the right. And just as a uh, another um, review, the Segno targets here are not the targets. The target of the Mandrito can be from the neck to the thigh, the Fendente can, well, the Fendente is sort of straight down. The Reversi also, the neck to the thigh, and the Sotani no higher than the the waist, the belly button, something like that. Okay? Um, so, this is a defense against a Mandrito attack, this one, okay? Um, likely to the neck, the upper chest, right? And um, what the defense is a grappling posta. It is posta longa, plain and simple, okay? The footwork for almost all of these covers is going to be something very small and slight, but um, consistent, which is an increasing step forward with your left foot, um, following with your uh, right foot, so that you're not overextended. Okay. Um, the reason for this is because we want to um, we want to intercept this dagger, regardless of our defense. We want to intercept it before it is finished its uh, its arc. So uh, if uh, so if you know if uh, this guy's dagger arc was you know was here, right? Um, Fiore wants to intercept it. Okay, can you see my uh, my snipping tool? Maybe you can't. Oh, you can't. All right, screw it. I forgot that. I was using a different program. <laughs> uh, you want to intercept the attack before it passes 90 degrees. Okay, so if a 180 degree arc is from your shoulder um, to the dagger is embedded in your enemy, um, you're, ideally you want to intercept the dagger uh, at 90 degrees or even a little sooner if possible uh, so that gravity does not make your... Um, make your defense harder and especially because you want to try and make the cover when the opponent has a foot in the air okay these attacks broadly speaking these dagger attacks are going to come with some kind of step forward from the enemy all right as opposed to some sort of small shuffle increasing step forward although of course that's possible too right that will make your job a little harder but um an ideal cover is one that not only 
gets into the attack before it's fully developed, but also interrupts the footwork. And it is that interruption that you're going to try and exploit immediately once you've made the cover. But anyway, so this attack here, this first master, he has intercepted a Mandrito attack with a Posta Longa while he's stepping in. Um, he's also charged a fist. Um, it's Emma Guelph's belief, broadly speaking, and I, I'm with them on this, that the first, um, the first cover comes with a strike to the face or the throat. This is not a, a universal belief. There are um, some free scholars who think that this is necessarily the case. It's possible, but it's not necessarily the case. But um, Emma Guelph uh, scholars and I uh, agree with them that this is, we think, what this means, what this entails. And not only because uh, getting a strike in there at the moment of the cover uh, is, uh, it fits the defense and it also facilitates what comes next. Okay. Um, the play that is in here this first master, the move, as it were, that's in here, that isn't shown, is a disarm. And this disarm is when this ma uh, a remedy master brings his hand, now that he's clasped the wrist of the dagger uh, man, to bring his hand basically to iron gate. And because this dagger is over the arm of the master, this actually uh, takes the dagger out of the person's hand. Uh, and it's possible to, the dagger can just drop. It's also possible for the master to pick it back up if they're really fancy. Um, but this is what this, this defense is. Okay. So it's the cover and also there's a disarm in the text. Aaron, uh, yes. It's a bit hard for me to tell from the illustrations there, but is that, is the dagger uh, inside or outside of the remedy? Master? Great question. The, the dagger is inside the arm. It's okay, inside. so the arm is going between the blade of the dagger and the attacker's forearm. Correct. So the reason why the 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 arm is uh, the reason why the dagger is on the inside of the arm is because the dagger's um, the dagger man's target is the master's neck. So it's you know it's coming. I mean I know it's drawn a little low here, but you have to you have to humor me. But so the dagger's coming down. And if you reach up towards the wrist, you're going to be coming underneath the dagger. So when you make contact with the wrist, the dagger ends up on the inside of your of your arm. However, you know, dagger is messy, right? We're going to return to this theme constantly. Dagger is messy. It's possible that this person's aim was terrible. They could have shifted their dagger. Maybe the dagger ends up on the outside of the arm. There's other things that we can do. Right. We're not going to do the disarm. We're going to do something else. Just like Fury says in grappling, you know, we're going to do this thing or other grapples that follow. OK, did I answer your question? Yeah, got it. great. OK, uh, moving up. The first counter. The first counter. Um, Andrew, would you like to read the text to the first counter? Okay, sure. Uh, with my dagger around your arm, I'll give you a turn, and through this counter, you won't be able to disarm me. This action, too, will surely result in my planting the dagger into your chest. All right, so this is the first of the um, very frightening and demoralizing <laughs> countermasters of the first Remedy Master. So, in response to the cover, which... Um, seems to have landed, right? This isn't a... There's other things that we're going to see later that are intercepting the cover or whatever. Even after the cover is made, or rather, in this case, instantly, as the cover is made, the dagger uh, man is going, to, is going to do exactly what I kind of hinted at just a second ago. They're going to take their dagger from the inside of the arm to the outside, they're going to flip it over. Well, they're not really, they're just going to, you know, going to pop it over the arm. Okay. Which means that the dagger is free. And even with this cover on the wrist, the, once the dagger is over the arm, it has, it has some freedom of motion where if it wasn't, if it was um, inside the arm, it wouldn't, it would be kind of, this arm would be kind of locking the wrist and the dagger in a bit of a triangle sort of structure. Now that this dagger is over the arm, the dagger uh, um, man may act 
the countermaster may act and can potentially continue the blow or reapply the blow to the chest or to the thigh or do any other number of things. Bring in his offhand, which is always part of a, you know, a counter situation. Um, but uh, this, this act directly um, frustrates the uh, basic intent of the, of the remedy master, which is to get that nice cover from underneath and to get, uh, to get control of the dagger. Yeah. Um, I should also, <laughs> I should also make another proviso. Uh, like many plays in this book, some of these plays, this one is a good example. They're, you know, the best explained in person on the floor. This is just a natural deficiency of the, you know, virtual medium. Uh, you know, in lieu of doing it on the floor, we're just going to have to take my word for some of these descriptions. I promise you, we'll um, hit you with all of these attacks when we see you on the floor in the cell. <laughs> so if you ever have to, if you ever wonder what what it feels like to be hit by one of these, uh, I promise you, we'll we'll get you there. <laughs> Wait, uh, shocking right. when you do the defense, and then the guy, the dagger just slips and around and hits you. Oh, the it's the worst. Oh, it's the worst. <laughs> and it's this isn't even the worst one. This is even the worst one. When I say that these countermasters are demoralizing, I mean it. And we will see we will see some some terrible assholes in just a moment. But first, another scholar. And he's, he's dressed so fine, too. Um, this is the middle key. The middle key. Um, Curran, would you like to read the text? I have locked your arm in a middle bind so that you won't give me any trouble. If I decide to throw you to the ground, I'll do so with no trouble at all. And don't even dream of freeing yourself from it. All right. So if we look past the arrogance, we see um, this interesting position. Okay. So, and first we also, we also see this dagger on the floor somehow. Um, there's been a disarm somewhere in here. Um, does he say? Yeah. Yeah, so I don't think the disarm in, in this depicted in this picture is coming from the middle key, although, of course, you know, maybe once he got his, you know, his shoulder broken, uh, maybe he let the dagger go. But anyway, so what's going on here? Um, we have yeah, we have what I said was a middle key. OK. Um, I should share my screen. Hold on a second. I'm just going to. Uh, I'm going to change the stream screen. Okay, can everybody see my screen again? Yep. Yep, everybody everybody can see my snip tool. Okay, great. So, um So here we have three the three keys, okay? We have uh, the high key the middle key and the lower key. Okay. These are concepts um, in many, many different martial arts as well, because human arms just bend, right? Um, they're, they're, when they're straight, they can be barred. When they're bent, they can be um, wrenched. And so what we see here is we see a case of a middle key and we see the uh, scholar inserting a lower key into the middle key and then what they're going to do is they're going to turn their their hand up so actually i should um uh, maybe i should do this maybe this would be more sense. Uh, 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 there we go <laughs> so this um this scholar has inserted a lower key per se a bent arm with the hand low into the middle key and what they're going to do is they're going to transition to posta frontale very violently right and directly and remember posta frontale is um, this guy so if you can imagine sinking this arm in here and then going to posta frontale what is this going to do this is going to take this elbow the elbow of the enemy and it's going to 
rotate it skyward. And uh, most people, uh, their elbow cannot go more than, you know, maybe 90 degrees, maybe, if they really bent their body and allowed it, right? So this action is going to destroy um, the shoulder of the enemy. All right. I'm not necessarily the elbow, although it's it's, it's possible, but it's going to destroy the shoulder of the of the enemy. Um, and it could and it's going to lead to other things, right? So obviously this isn't going to kill the um uh, the enemy. Um, it could make him rethink fighting you, of course. Um, it could lead to yeah, it could lead to who who knows, right? Based on how the enemy reacts. But if the dagger is in hand, which oftentimes in MSLs we practice. Um, we practice this play with the dagger in hand. Um, you, it's a very secure, uh, solid uh, cover on the dagger. And the principal thing that you've gained here, which is, um, which is typical when we cover the dagger when we, don't, we, when we don't have a weapon, what we want is control of the dagger arm. So by inserting your hand uh, in here, um, you've gained... Um, fairly significant control over the dagger arm such that it's not going to leave and come back at you. And then once you've gained this control, you can work on destroying it, disarming the dagger, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But the uh, person who's got here has not only made the cover, but has controlled the dagger so that it can't come back at them. So they're really working themselves up from being dead just, as, uh, <laughs> uh, just a second ago when they were attacked with the dagger while unarmed. I should go back and mention that the ener the typical energy context for the a disarm in the first remedy master is a stay energy. So immediately on the case of the cover, if the arm remains in place, just for a moment, right? And this is typical for all disarms. The disarms are. Um, are typical on stay energies, or at least they're optimal on stay energies, not least because it's very difficult for the offhand to come in and disarm. It's very difficult to, to affect a disarm when the hand is moving. Very easy to make a mistake. This middle key, um, it can happen on a stay energy depending on how bent the arm is. It could also happen on a pullback, because of course, if the, dag if the dagger man is attacking Mendrito, you make the cover, and they pull their um, their arm back, their hand back to make another attack. Conventionally, they're going to be pulling it up to the top right, where their dagger came from, and then that'll facilitate a possible middle key. Okay? Um, so, uh, does, that, does everybody kind of get this? Well, anyways, we'll return to, we'll, we'll see some keys, some more keys later. Um, but just remember, high key... Um, middle key, lower key. Okay. All right. Um, the next one. The counter. Oh man, but it was such it was such a good play. Um, <laughs> next one. Let's go. Graham. Would you like to read the text? Sure. Uh, this is the counter to the previous play. Look at the situation in which I've put this man. I'll then either break his arm or throw him to the ground. All right, so, um, whoops, <laughs> he died. <laughs> so here's the counter to, to the to the play, as um, as the text says. Very simple. Uh, if this is done poorly, not only did you place yourself into a lower key, where the enemy has a lower key on you. Not only that, but um, they could stab you in the back <laughs> or the back of the head with their dagger once the dagger man uh, doubles up. Um, the takeaway from this, other than the obvious, like don't don't um, uh, fuck that play up, <laughs> the takeaway is that this counter, or rather the counter of the dagger man doubling up, is going to be the a consistent counter theme. So there are some tricks and some interesting things depending on what Remedy Master we're, we're countering. But broadly speaking, the counter to um, a, um, a dagger action is, from the dagger man's perspective, is going to be to double up. Okay? Um, so we'll see that. We'll see that a lot. In this case, the guy's just doubled up. Why might this happen? 
usually uh, these these counters uh, occur, especially these in such a catastrophic way, when the timing is off. So you know if you made the cover, struck him in the um, you know in the throat, he pulled back a little reflexively. You 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 dive that middle key in, and then you set the middle key in frontally, broken his shoulder, and you moved on in one continuous motion then you may have a chance of getting it done, right? But if you made the cover, paused, you know, uh, second-guessed yourself, he pulled his dagger back, but he kind of felt what you were doing, then you dived in, but you overcommitted a bit, you tried to rush it, and then he was like, ah, I see you coming a mile away, and he plants in your back, right? That's it. That can easily happen when the timing's off. And circumstantially, those of you who have done dagger at full speed with full force know that this happens most of the time <laughs> because most of the time we try to pull these things off, we fail because we have the timing off by, you know, a half a moment, which is a half a moment too much. So this is just dagger being, being dagger. All right. Next one. The first upper key. First upper key. Um, who's next? Let's get Mark. Can you please read the text here? Here's a good parry to get your dagger from you. I can also use this grapple to put you in a good bind. If I put my right hand under your right knee, I can quickly make you fall since I am an expert in this art. All right. So we just talked about doubling up. So here we have the scholar doubling up on the a dagger arm, which is great. I really love things like this. Um, this is a very sort of classic upper key. Um, so we have the dagger, we have the defense right on the uh, the linchpin of the of of the arm, um, and we have the offhand coming in at the elbow. And what this is going to do is it's going to bend the whole thing. Um, well, actually, I can't sh I can't show this um, because. This is 2D, but it's we're gonna we're gonna bend this the wrong way. So this this isn't this isn't gonna be like this isn't necessarily gonna be straight back. It's gonna be like to the side almost, like back and to the side, in the way that the elbow is not supposed to bend, right? Um, so yeah, so th that that could be a nice upper key. It could cause a throw if it's more back than to the side. It can cause an unbalancing excuse me, of the opponent, and this front front leg can tip up a bit, and that can give you a, a leg pickup. So you can get a leg throw as well. We're going to see um, a bunch of these different uh, leg pickups as we go through the book. Um, also, broadly speaking, just to continue to keep us in the same vein, despite what some of these images show, the uh, nature of the first remedy master is to the outside to the outside of the uh, of the enemy. When you, we make the cover, we make the cover with a little increasing step off to the side, um, like like on a at a forty five degree angle kind of thing, directly towards the dagger, and this puts us forward and a little to the side of the uh, of the enemy. Um, we don't have that. The step has to be small because there's no time. So it's small, quick to the side, and then all of the actions that we prosecute, we prosecute to the outside of the opponent's lead leg and lead uh, arm. Okay. And uh, what else is there? anything? Blah 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 blah. blah. Yeah, that's fine. The next counter. Now, before we move on to the counter, let's just take a think. Let's guess what the counter is going to be, right? Let's think about. Oh, sorry, Aaron. Before mm -hmm. we go. Mm -hmm. What's the energy for this uh, ah, situation? Yes, um, excellent. Thank you. So, the um, the energy for this sort of thing is more than likely a pullback. And why is that? Well, because ideally, the energy or the the moves that we're going to do, as in 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 fencing, as in dagger, they're going to be in the direction or according to the energy that the opponent is doing anyway. Because this is a very effective way for us to mask our intentions. If we move counter to the energy or to the flow of the enemy, they can feel that and they can sense that. And anything that we do is going to be bad, right? Because we're trying to kill them and they're trying to kill us. So we want to try and mask our intentions as, be as best we can. 
Um, well, and but isn't the energy of the first color also a pullback? Uh, it can't. It can be, or a stay. But in this case, if this was a stay energy, this is a fairly decent, mo you know, decently sized motion. It would be fairly obvious what we were trying to do. What we'd be trying to do if the dagger was was silent here, right? Because what we're really trying to we're trying to break their arm. But if they're pulling back and accentuating the bend, then we have a chance of moving with them and putting this on them before they really know what's before they really feel the trouble. So the the energy for this is a is a probably a pullback. Thank you. All right. So um, great, great, great question. Please um, bug me if I forget uh, to, to mention that every time. All right. Here's the counter. Shocker. Uh, here we go. The text moving on. Uh, Mike, would you like to read the text, please? Yes, I would. I am about to perform the counter to the previous play, preventing you from throwing me to the ground, disarming me, or placing me in a bind. On the other hand, you'll be compelled to relinqu relinquish your grip, and your body will quickly become a nice sheath for my weapon. You. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. So, the counter. Um, shocker. It is probably just what most of you expected, um, though you'll note that doubling up um well bringing in the offhand takes several forms okay we uh, saw in the counter to the middle key we saw a double up on the dagger hand okay in this case we're seeing a double up on the blade itself okay we could also see a double up on the position itself so the the countermaster could have say um brought his offhand in and just wiped off this hand from the elbow broken the grip right and then maybe moved on to another counter like with the the flick that we saw in the, the counter to the uh the the, the first reverdy master right um, but this is the theme that we're talking about with doubling up now in this case he's doubled up on the blade which has given the countermaster back the control and the leverage of the dagger he's holding a short um a short item with both hands the the person who's holding the dagger those nice rondelles make it fit in your hand and holding the blade they have by far the better leverage and um scholars who have trained this will know that working this dagger through this blizzard of grapples is going to be it's going to be a fun thing to do because it's not that difficult. And not only that, but the dagger has a point on it, and that point can stab stuff. So what this guy's doing, he's doubling up on the blade, and he's going to be stabbing what he can stab and rotating and working the dagger back to his posta to break the grip and then give a chance to reapply the dagger. Okay? Um, so this guy's, um, this guy's in big trouble. Um, what else do we say? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, maybe one more thing to say. So he says, on the other hand, you'll have to let go. And your body will become a nice sheath for my weapon. So um, it's hard to train this stuff at full speed. And we, you know, we can't train it with a sharp dagger. What we can do is we can train it at full speed with metal daggers that are blunt, but ones we use at full force so that it really, really, really sucks balls when we get hit by it. And in that way, you know, we can kind of kind of approach it. And in that context, it's my experience that if you let go, it's over. And that the the, the, the hope and the prayer that you 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 need as the dagger uh, as the defender, when you're unarmed against a dagger man who knows what they're doing. The only hope and prayer you have is number one to make the cover. That's always the minimum. The without which um, not. You got to make the cover, but then you need to keep control of that dagger hand. Because once you lose control, they have a dagger. Or once you lose control of the dagger hand, they have a dagger, and they're in distance with this deadly weapon, and you don't have direct engagement of it. Which means the only information that you can use to get back control of it is you know 
the guesswork or other contact which you may have, which can be easily uh, uh, mistaken or uh, the, the, the enemy can fool you or prevent you from doing all, all sorts of things. So this cover and this grip is, you know, paramount. And what the dagger person is going to do is going to try to get you to let go. Basically, that's basically it. So when we talk about when we talk about the lion, when we talk about dagger needing, you know, your full commitment, it's kind of in recognition of that fact that these counters, not only are they actually really pretty easy for the dagger person to do, but they're very deadly to the defender. So this is why dagger is a full energy, full audacia situation. Because there's no there's no escape. There's no way that either you rip his arm off and disarm the dagger and survive, or uh, you know throw him to the ground and kill him, or you don't, or you die. And that's that. That's it. That's all there is. That's all there is in here. All right, third scholar. Speaking of death, <laughs> or throwing people's ass to the ground, we got the clothesline. The classic clothesline. Uh, Renat, would you like to read the text here? This is a blade that admits no counter. The opponent will surely go to the ground and be disarmed. Since the student can do this to him, as you can see. And once he's on the ground, the student can finish the play with other actions. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so this is, uh, this is a pretty devastating play um, not only because it results in one massive throw but also because of this so this we call this the close or at Amatron anyway we colloquially refer to this as the clothesline and we do because this isn't just say like an upper key to the head right you're gonna smash your forearm into their neck here and the your hand is going to wrap around the back of their head as a consequence. There's a reason why this, well, we think, there's a reason why this figure looks particularly <laughs> disturbed. <laughs> it's because he's got his throat crushed and he's about to be hurtled uh, to, to the ground. Um, it's more than likely that this energy, or that this, uh, yeah, this comes from a pullback energy where it's, it's a pullback with a straight arm. So as opposed to a pullback with a bent arm, um, like in the middle keys case or maybe one of these, a pullback with a straight arm is going to give you a clothesline opportunity. Okay, if you if somebody attacks you and inexplicably with such poor um, structure as to attack you with some sort of wide straight arm to give you this hole to step into, then I suppose maybe sure you can do it. But um, yeah, so. You know, you, uh, you you move hand, body, foot first. You clothesline him in the neck, step behind him, and then and then throw him. Um, if you can pull this off, it's very uh, it's it's really great. Fury says this admits of no counter. Um, we've discussed this in the scholar class several times. I may have mentioned it here before. It's not really obvious what this means, but uh, my my theory is that what it means is that uh, if it's done in time, if it's done in time, then it's very difficult for the enemy to counter, right? Once this is started, uh, it's uh, this, you know, the Daggerman's in a very bad way, not least because their Fortitudo is immediately at risk. Okay, as opposed to say, you know, this middle key, this middle key is not gonna threaten the Fortitudo necessarily of the enemy. They can square up, they can double up. Even if they lost the dagger, they could they could do tons of stuff to reverse this. They could try for the lower key reversal. Um, so this is you know something that can be uh, can be countered. Once this is started, it's very difficult to counter. Having said that, obviously, if it's done in the wrong time, it's also very easy to counter because this is a large action uh, from the uh, from the defending scholar. But that's like saying nothing because everything can be countered in the wrong time. All right. Sorry, just to confirm. So yes. as you do, you, you like step forward and get, do, you, do you get hip to hip? Because like in the image, it's kind of confusing how far away the two people are. It's a great question. Typically, I think we teach it that we go hip to hip. 
but um, you know the the, spe the specifics of of you know how far can you get away away from hip to hip, we'd have to discuss on the floor. But it's going to be deep, as deep as as possible. And so this is gonna this is gonna be a a passing step from the uh, cover. So here's the cover with the uh, left foot forward. He's pulled back with a straight arm. You're going to be pa passing with the right foot into this hole here and close lining with that, with that hand. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, all right. So he says there's no counter, and sure enough, there's no counter. So on to the fifth scholar. A folio 11 RD. Uh, who gets to read this one? Uh, Amber, would you like to read this one? This play is not very common in the art of the dagger, but it is a defense worth knowing. The student can employ this parry and then strike his opponent either in the thigh or in the stomach. All right. So this one. Oh, boy. <laughs> This is, um, it's funny, Fiori is, isn't really, you know, he's, he doesn't really underplay things very often, if at all. <laughs> Usually he does the opposite, but I, I can't help but read this as some sort of hilarious, like, under, un, uh, under exaggeration. <laughs> um, this play is not very common in the art of the dagger. All right, so, so what the hell is going on here? This play is a, you know, parry is not a bad, uh, it's not a bad, uh, term here that Fiori is using. This play is a parry. This play is unique. One, mm, am I about to lie to you? Mm, I don't think so. This play is unique in the dagger section in that it um, it doesn't uh, def it doesn't stop the dagger arm. In fact, um, uh, I almost lied to you. There are there are a couple dagger plays in the whole corpus where you actually leave once you've made the cover you actually leave control of the dagger wrist very few though in this one you don't even stop the blow you actually deflect it away so so this is very 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 risky right because you're not, you know, this defense is not uh, it, on the on the certainty scale, very low on the certainty scale, very low, right? If you screw this up, you can be uh, well, you're going to be stabbed in the arm and then subsequently killed and gloriously, and the people will laugh at you. All right, why would you would choose to do this play uh, as opposed to the other ones? I have no idea, but. Fiori says it's a defense worth knowing. And insofar as, you know, if we can take our, you know, if we can zoom out a little bit, what the hell are we looking at here? We can see that he's making contact in Posa Longa, but he's coming to the outside of the dagger hand. And he's apparently going to deflect this dagger strike away. And then after he deflects it away, he says, you can then strike your opponent either in the thigh or in the stomach. So it appears as if what's happening is this dagger man has come in to stab Fiore, stab the scholar, and the scholar has stepped, you know, has uh, increased forward, deflected the dagger, and then come in with a sh step or a shuffle with his back foot, and then struck uh, in passing the enemy in the, you know, in the liver or in the upper thigh. Okay. Um, knowing what we what we know about pain compliance, we know that this is curious, not least because it doesn't actually stop the problem. The problem is the dagger arm is free, and it is free to enter our body, right? Stru punching him doesn't stop the problem, right? If we punched him in the first master cover, well, that's great. That's just gravy. That's icing on the cake, because we've already made the cover, right? And we punched him at the same time uh, for good measure. This doesn't even make the cover. It deflects the, the the dagger attack and it's followed with a strike, which is, you know, pain compliance. Is it going to take him out? Maybe, maybe not. Probably not. Wouldn't necessarily want to bet your life on it, would you? But all would depend on what happens, right? Maybe striking him in the liver would double him over, 
and then you could get a superior position and maybe you could potentially even kill him. Maybe he wouldn't even register. Who knows, right? But the interesting, interesting thing to note here is that a cover, as it were, isn't made, right? The blow is not stopped, right? And after the this defense, control is not achieved of the dagger hand, and it is free. So this means, in my view anyway, this means the context of this is something like saying, look, it's possible to parry these dagger strikes, to deflect them away, right? Maybe allow yourself to get into a better position. Maybe you got surprised and this was, you know, and this was your last ditch attempt or whatever. It's possible to do these things. It's definitely worth knowing. But it's not very common. Okay. Um, yeah. Having said that, if you had a dagger in your hand, this would change a lot, wouldn't it? If you made this cover with the dagger in your hand, that strike is not going to become a punch to the liver or the upper thigh. That's going to become a dagger attack of your own. So it might be might be pretty good, or or at least it might be might be much better. That might end the fight. Okay, so this is a really cool one. It um it uh, blips a bit from some of the principles of defense that we've seen so far with with Fury, um, and it also has no counter circumstantially. Although that's not necessarily because it's uh, not counterable. It's just more of a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting one. Okay. Um, I've seen more, <laughs> I've seen more recruits stabbed in the face <laughs> because of this one than any other single defense we've ever tried. Because <laughs> they, they just, they, 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 they miss the, they miss the deflection by just the nip, nip, they just miss it and you know the their partner is doing what they're supposed to and giving them a real attack and then douche <laughs> oh it's awful but that's just the nature of this of this defense it's uh it's tricky it makes you appreciate some of the the more sure ones all right um a counter is this a counter to the previous play what the hell is going on here who's the next reader zifang would you like to read the text for us? Uh, sure. I'm the counter to the first king of dagger called Remedy. He who lets the opponent seize his left hand will find it hard to perform remedies to his own place. This grapple allows me to plant my dagger into his back. Okay, cool. So here is a countermaster that is not countering the scholar before him. So the scholar before him, the one we just looked at, is this deflection play. This countermaster is directly to the um, to the uh, play itself, the cover itself. Okay. So um, this is uh, this is hard to describe, but basically what happens is the dagger, uh, the attacker, brings their hand up. If you can. If you can look at your left hand, if you can form a U between your um, between your uh, fing your fingers and your thumb, right? You have all your fingers together, and sort of the the you know the the shape between your index finger and your thumb going into your palm is going to be something of a U shape. Okay, this shape can be inserted into the wrist under the wrist of the opponent's cover, okay, of, of the of the scholar's cover. So this, um, this uh, attacker is going to insert his hand underneath this wrist and grasp his own dagger on the on the inside with his fingers. And he's going to grasp the inside of the enemy's wrist with his thumb. Okay, or the sorry, the uh, the outside, because we see in this in this first master defense, the um you know the inside of the wrist is facing out, right, as opposed to facing facing in. The inside of the wrist is facing to the uh, left, right. So um, the counter here is this attacker has come in, grasped the inside of the wrist and the outside of the wrist, 
and his own dagger and has kind of shifted his position and squeezed that a little bit to get a bit of a bar, an arm bar. Okay, and this is actually done with a little Volta Stabile too. It's actually pretty, it's pretty slick. It's pretty slick. Um, and once this, once this is done, the thumb is going to act as a, what we call a check, which is like a temporary resistance, right? The thumb is going to act as a check to the wrist to allow the dagger to free itself and then reapply itself, right? Once this dagger leaves, it's one arm on one arm, so you're not going to you're not going to arm bar him with one arm, right? But you're grasping his defending arm now and you're kind of on his outside. And you have a free dagger. So this guy is screwed. Right? He, you know, short of some, you know, witty superhero quip or some superpowers, this guy's in, in big trouble. Um so this is a, this is a really neat little um it's a neat little counter. Um and it, it's really actually really fun to practice on the floor. But the main important theme is, of course, again, uh, doubling up. The dagger person is going to be doubling up to make their counters. Okay? Um, yeah, is that everything? Probably. Cool. Moving on. <laughs> oh, we're at this one. Oh, boy. All right, here we go. We're at the... What's affectionately known as the fish. We have the um, the fifth counter, fifth counter of the first harmony master. Um, all the way at the top, Alex, would you like to read the text? I am also a counter to this first remedy of dagger. The grapple that this student performs enables me to strike him and forces him to let go of me. And if he attempts other plays against me, I can perform the counter without any delay. All right, so this guy's an asshole, all right? We hate this guy. And we hate him because, well, I shouldn't say hate him. Maybe we love him because he really shows us how Dagger really is, okay? <laughs> this guy, this counter, what this is is this Dagger uh, attacker, he's making his normal Mandrito attack, right? But he knows his stuff. And he knows that what really makes an attack is the commitment of the foot. A lot of really interesting fencing uh, tricks and provocations and interesting advanced theory is founded on the principle that footwork is commitment to your action. So if you make a small shift in your position, maybe your hand position or whatever, Without footwork, you can um, make, you you might encourage someone to believe that you're doing one thing when really you you haven't committed. You haven't you know you or you're doing something else. Um, this is uh, this this happens in fencing a lot. In this case, the dagger person, at least as conventionally we understand this play, the dagger person has attacked with his hand and his body, but he has withheld the commitment of the foot. Such that the his opponent, the unarmed person, has bought that he's throwing a mandrito. And so he, you know, he gives the strike as normal. You know, he winds up, he extends hand, body, reserves the foot. And as he sees this post along shooting out, he shoots out his offhand. And instead of intercepting the dagger, this poor fool intercepts the offhand. And the dagger is free as a bird. And it's going to stab this guy. This is a brutal, brutal, brutal uh, counter. And it is almost impossible to stop. Like, it's, it's, it is so hard to tell if this is going on and even if you know it's going on it's so hard to you know compensate for it right this is a very demoralizing uh counter not not just not just because it's you know demoralizing about our counters to the uh, mandrito attack 
but it's showing us that again the counters to the dagger person the dagger defender the counters are so effective and they're pretty damn easy they're really not that big of a deal and uh, it just underscores how screwed this person is right and again how how hard they have to try to get undead from the situation um, but yeah, this one is just brutal. It is, however, very much fun to practice in class. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Why is the, um, the attacker, like, his foot is drawn as if he is stepping? Like uh, The attacker? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because he's, he, he has given his foot. So he, so you're, in this case, the attacker is reserving his foot, but he's giving his foot to the offhand not to the main not to the main counter so the this this passing step is going to be to intercept the cover and then he's going to reapply the dagger once uh once he's done that after he's intercepted the cover he's he's in uh time of the hand range he can just use his hand to strike he doesn't have to do any more for you know what i mean he can strike his arm he can strike his body so he's already in but the hand is uh, the, the 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 step, the passing step, is reserved for the off hand, not the dagger hand. In this case, I guess I'm just curious why he seems to be stepping into uh, like in, into the guy. Like, okay, so you're you're using your left hand to block the enemy's left hand. Yep. And you're stepping to the left. Should, wouldn't you want to step to the right in order to like be able to catch the defending? Ah, arm? okay. Yeah, I um, I'll I'll say I said this before. I hope, and I will say it again, and I'll repeat it as many times as we need. Um, these pictures, the footedness in these pictures is not always reliable. So you know uh, whether or not you'd end up on the inside of the position here, or on the outside, is you know you suggest you know that's going to depend on you know what's up. Uh, these figures are actually drawn rather close, footedness wise. You could, you know, being on the inside of the enemy, of the defender's position here wouldn't invalidate this play. Being on the outside would be cool, um, but it's not it's not that important um, where this uh, what this looks like. This is the big thing here, right? This this defense being intercepted is an absolute catastrophe. Catastrophe. There's almost no way back from this because this dagger is completely isolated now. Right, and it's very—it's also pretty pretty easy for this dagger man to keep con to keep contact of this arm, right? If this you know uh, this hand can come to attack the enemy's wrist as well, it can get, grab hold of it. Um, you know, this person is in; he's got a free dagger. It's you know, this arm is, you know, it's this guy's in big trouble. It's just—it's a great—it's just a great counter. All right. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, let me see. Yeah. All right. Nothing else to say. Ah, oh, daggers. Daggers crazy. All right. Okay, cool. So here's the, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 11 VC. This is a follow on. Okay. Uh, moving on. Andrew, would you like to read this text? This counter is not what sorry this counter is not my own. The play I do is that of the counter right above, i.e. the second counter in which the dagger is used to bind the opponent's hand, where I say that you should you could stick the dagger in the opponent's back. Although that play calls for a thrust to the opponent's back, in this I stick my weapon in his chest. But it is still the same play since this is another option. Okay, so what he's referring to is he says that this count, this finish, this is a this is displayed as another counter master, but it's not. It's a finish. This finish is to this play here, eleven VA, eleven VB, eleven VC. So this play is underneath this one in the text. And he says, <laughs> it's actually really weird. He refers to it directionally. This is the play above me. Oh, man. Um, but he's saying that this is the that this is the counter belonging to uh, this guy. But for whatever reason, Fiore decided to show uh, stabbing the guy in the chest instead, in the front, 
rather than in the back. So how might we understand this? Well, you know, is it a, is it a counter to the fourth? Is it a counter to the fourth counter, or is it a finishing no, move? No, it's a finish. Okay. It's a finish. It's exactly the same as this. He says in this text here, I could stab him in the back. What might we expect as a reaction from the uh, from the defender in this case? We might expect him to stand up and to turn to face the enemy. That's a basic you know reset uh reaction right stand you know stand tall get your fourth tuto back face the tar uh, of the enemy and the weapon deploy your defenses try to get get yourself out of the problem so you know if he's bent over if his back is available he'll stab him in the back if he stands up and turns towards you a bit you'll just stab him in the chest and that's what fury is saying okay um it's really not not much more than that than that um yeah yeah that's it thanks very lots of murder here all right next one. Oh, another key another key folio 11 vd um curran would like to read this text i am a student of the first king and remedy i use this grapple to take your weapon away and bind you up since I don't believe you will know the counter. This is why I do this without delay. <laughs> this, is, this is a funny line. I'm not really sure what he means by that. <laughs> Since I don't think you know your shit, is what he says. All right. Um, so, uh, okay. So here we go. We call this a figure four. Colloquially known as a figure four. So this is, a, this is an example of a high key. Okay. <clears throat> um, so what's going on here is the... A defender with a really cool hat. I should get myself one of those hats. Is uh, he's made the defense, but he's inserted his offhand over the arm of the enemy, and his hand is going to come back onto his wrist, and it's going to kind of make a, uh, a, a the number four. That's why we call it figure four. And what he's going to do then is he's going to he's while holding the elbow fixed. And by having leverage on the wrist, he's going to bend the wrist to the side of the elbow in a way that it's not supposed to bend, and thereby um, potentially break the elbow or the shoulder. Okay, this picture is very, um, uh, it's not really helpfully drawn in that this play is best done to the outside of the enemy and not on the inside. On the inside, it's very, very easy to counter. And also it's very hard. It's harder just to get the leverage. So this play as drawn is a bit misleading as to the optimum, uh, uh, as to the optimum positioning when you finally execute the uh, high key. And it's gonna come from classically a pullback energy. Broadly speaking, the keys are going to come from pullback energies. The disarms are going to come from stay energies, and the breaks are going to, in the th in a lot of the throws, are going to come from push through energy. Although of course there are exceptions. Okay. Um, what anything to say about this one? Um, choo, choo, choo. Yeah, pretty, pretty much it. Figure four. Uh, the this one is really hard. Um, people have a lot of problems in recruit class with this one, mostly because if this elbow is free and floating in the air, like it's drawn here, this is almost impossible to do. So you have to actually get chest to elbow with this and to the side of the enemy in order to really put this on. If this arm is floating around, it's it's hard to do. And this offhand is going to shoot in and come to the counter. Now, if you had to guess what the counter was to this, what might you think? Hmm. We shall see in one moment. The counter. Oh, there it is. <laughs> the seventh counter. Uh, Graham. Oh, no. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Graham, would you like to read this one? Um, I perform this counter to prevent you from disarming me and binding my arm while my dagger and I remain free. Then I'll strike you as you let go of me in such a way that you won't be able to defend yourself. 
Oh, right. So the counter is just as what you would expect. By now. Nothing really fancy about it. He's doubling up on the hilt. Um, probably principally because the his his dagger wrist here is under extreme threat. This is a pretty secure position. Um, and it wouldn't necessarily be great. It could work if you doubled up on the blade. But doubling up on the hilt is um, going to really help. It's going to make the wrist secure. And it's going to allow you then to insist the position. Um, when I talk about insisting a position, I basically mean, um, you know, uh, making sure a position isn't changing and then putting pressure on the position. So in this case, the dagger is, you know, in the enemy's presence, ideally pointed at, the, at them. If their defense collapses, they die and you have a secure uh, structure here. So the dagger person is, um, they're in a bit of trouble, right? They didn't kill them on the first murder attempt, so that's kind of shit. But they have a pretty secure position and they can insist the dagger point towards the enemy. And that's either going to force them to let go, which is great, or, um, you know, or die. If this person's stronger, obviously, this might not be ideal. The dagger person might have to get a little more creative. Next one. Or basically, mm -hmm. dramatic Hollywood shoves the dagger into the chest. Uh, uh, say that again. It's basically a dramatic Hollywood shoving the dagger into the chest. Uh, yeah. If they <laughs> if they stood here and one and, and one of them said, "You'll never kill me, Doctor," you know, uh, evil. And this guy said, "I've always hated you and your whatever." Yeah, that that sort of thing. Uh, clearly, I'm not a Hollywood scriptwriter. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's uh, it's very good. There would be some gritted teeth for sure with this one. <laughs> All right, um, the next scholar, the sixth scholar of the first remedy master, uh, Mike. Would you like to read this one? Yep, oh, I should give you the text. There we go. This pair is called more strength. I execute it to be able to give you trouble in many different plays. You won't be able to nullify my strength since two arms evil easily overpower one. All right, cool. So this play is important, okay? First of all, it's important to note that Fiore is sometimes really not creative. <laughs> Why is this? This is more strength. Why? Because it's more strength in one arm. Oh, okay. Thanks, Fiore. <laughs> so this is this is the, the more strength parry. We saw this in the dagger postas. This is our doubled. This is our doubled guy right here. And he's made a doubled parry against a, man, uh, a, a Mandrito dagger attack. Fiori says, I execute it to be able to give you trouble in many different plays. What more, um, what um, the first master can do, eh, right away, what the first master can do more strength can do everything the first master can do more strength can do because it's essentially getting the same it's getting the same cover okay so all the things that we just saw just 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 previous um we can do and you won't be able to nullify my strength since two arms easily overpower one well if we were in any doubt of this before we are no, we are no longer okay We've seen this principle uh, really stressed to us with the counters because the counters are often doubling up, right? But, of course, the counters are often doubling up on a position where the enemy is, uh, or the defender has brought in both their arms already. So it's kind of equalizing it, right? But here Fiore says very clearly, you won't be able to nullify my strength since two arms easily overpower one. So broadly speaking, this is a state of affairs which we work for very, very intentionally in Abrazare and in Dagger. And really everywhere we can. We work to gain a position where all of our weapons are on half or less of his. So in this case, when the defense is made, that uh, high key where the arm needs to be on the elbow, or the offhand needs to be at the elbow, 
right? That is literally like, that is gifted to this guy on a silver platter, right? Because his hands are already there, right? He can go instant, right? The middle key, right? I, I personally hate doing the middle key like this. I hate it because I feel like it's pretty easily countered. I prefer, uh, and it's shown, well, it's not shown here, but it's shown elsewhere in the in the in the in the, um, in the dagger section, doing the middle key with the offhand already on the elbow. So it looks very much, it's very similar to this situation, except you're doing the middle key with it, right? Um, two arms are better than one, okay? So this is always something that we're going to try and get um in uh, in dagger and broadly speaking uh, everywhere okay um yeah and this is more strength so more strength this poster to here uh I, I i navigated away from it but whatever this doubled uh posta isn't going to get its own remedy master it's the only one that doesn't yes that's correct it's the only one that doesn't but it's being shown here why is it being shown in the first a remedy master well probably because more strength is best suited to defending mandritos and it's possible to get away with it with fendentes but it cannot defend a reversos and it um i guess it, uh, it i guess it can defend sotanis but yeah i guess it could i guess it could Good defense with Tani's too. But uh, oh and, and he and he um and he does actually mention it. I was about to lie to you, but he does actually mention it. He mentions the he mentions this in the um, in the eighth remedy master, he shows you a way of defending against the Sotani with a dagger doubled and an action uh, from that, and then he shows you defending against it in more strength. And he shows you defending against a Sultani crossed. So great. So more strength can ha can occur against a Sultani. That's true, but it um, doesn't work very well with um, Fendentes, and uh, it doesn't work at all with uh, Reverses. So against the Mendrito, it's very very well um, designed. Why does Fury start with the Mendrito? Well, who knows? But maybe. He starts with the Mendrito and all of them, these masters encounters against the Mendrito attack because most people, at least the, the normal non-weird ones, are right-handed. <laughs> most people are right-handed, and uh, the right-handed attack is the most common attack. And that's just bog standard, right? So it makes sense if you're going to start somewhere, it makes sense to start with a dagger attack. That's this attack coming from the right side. And um, it, the dagger, when you're attacking with a dagger, it naturally has something of an angle to it, unless you're intentionally trying to bring it down straight, um, like a fendente, right? A natural attack from the right side is going to be some, going to be a little, a, a little angled. It's going to be Mendrito-esque, sorry. It's going to be Mendrito-esque. So that may be why he, indeed, he, uh, he started here. And sure enough, we have not only the Postalonga defense, but we also have a uh, more strength defense. Okay. Um, all right. So um, who else is here? So I'm I'm fine to go on till ten o'clock tonight. But um, just in case some of you have to peace out, um, let's just take a quick um, uh, quick look at what else we have in store for the rest of the first uh, Re Re Remedy Master. So where are we? We're here. We have more strength. We have the counter to more strength, which is an elbow push. We have the Santa sack, what we call the Santa sack. Then we have the counter to the Santa sack. Then we have an, another disarm. Then we have a counter to that disarm. Then we have a throw. And then we have the counter to that throw. And that's it. Okay. Um, all right, moving on. Let's go to the counter to the more strength okay we will notice that the counter to the more strength is going to be an elbow push okay but I, i'll save that till we read the text um oh my. mike would you like to read the text
This is the counter to the previous play, i.e. the play of more strength. I give the opponent a turn with my left hand, then I strike him without fail. Awesome. All right, so just like many plays we've seen already, uh, where two arms are engaged in an, um, you know, in an engagement, uh, when two arms are, are, are engaged, the elbow push counter is available. And Fiore loves it. Talk, he does it all the time. Uh, so here's Fiore doing this elbow push. It's going to be stout. Um, and it's going to be... It, with elbow pushes in general, it seems as if the elbow push would actually be pushing the elbow through the center here. Right? As if you were, like, barring the elbow or something. That would seem like it would be a smart idea. But it's actually not. This elbow push, you want it to be supported by your structure. And so if you push this elbow straight and back to this, you know, almost to the inside of the shoulder, that's going to be a much more devastating elbow push. Because all you're, all you're trying to do, all you're trying to do affect is a, a slight turn in their, in their posture. A slight turn will ruin this defensive position. It'll give your dagger some awesome targets and it'll really, you know, it'll basically put you home free. So um, L, these elbow pushes are generally speaking into the opponent rather than into thin air. All right, um, but that's easier seen on the floor. Um, but yeah, elbow push, shocker. Seventh scholar, the Santa Sack. Renat, would you like to read this one? Yep, oh, I should give you the text. The good grapple I have you in won't fail to break your arm over my left shoulder. Then I can strike you with your dagger. This play that cannot fail. This is a play that cannot fail. All right, so um, this play is affectionately known as the Santa Sack. I don't know why anyone would want to ruin Christmas with murder, but Emma's just like that. Um, <laughs> this play, uh, it's uh, I, I think it's often talked about in terms of a pullback with a straight arm. Um, it's possible it could come from a push through with a straight arm as well, depending on um, what's going on. But basically, you get into this play pretty directly from the counter, uh, from the from the cover. So the co the covers here, um, either they're pushing through with a straight arm, um, or they're um, I actually think the push through is probably the more common way we 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 engage with it. So if, the, if they have a nice big straight arm and they're still pushing through your position, even though you've made the counter, you can uh, you can shift your position to place, kind of turning your back to the opponent to place their elbow, broadly speaking, on your shoulder. The aiming point that we uh, usually suggest in class for this is we actually suggest it at the elbow, breaking the elbow just behind the elbow rather than the shoulder. Uh, this is an interesting little uh, divergence that the scholars noticed um, last week or the week before, where even though Fury says specifically, well, you know, he doesn't say specifically, break your arm over my left shoulder. Well, there you go, right? Uh, but the, of course, the picture shows engagement at the shoulder. So, you know, isn't that interesting? Um, he also says, and then I can k strike you with my wait, dagger. Wait, so what, what's, mm -hmm. the what's the inconsistency if, he, if the image is shoulder and the text is shoulder? Well, the, but the text, said, the text says, I um I have you in a good grapple that won't fail to break your arm over my left shoulder. So by break your arm, does he mean break your arm like at the elbow or break your arm at his shoulder? Because the pic in the picture, it looks like the, the, the scholar who's breaking the arm is really deep at the joint of the shoulder, not at the joint of the elbow. Right, but we typically oh, wow. teach it at the joint of the elbow. So the the enemy's elbow, not your own elbow. Yeah, the the enemy's oh, okay. elbow. Sorry, I thought right? you meant like to break over your own elbow. No, right? sorry, sorry, I'm, I I apologize. Yeah, because um, if if you can if you can land mark the straight arm, right at the, um, right in front of the elbow, you can snap it like a like a twig. Right, it's very very. It's actually kind of dangerous to practice. Uh, as it happens, um, this is this is one of those ones where we kind of fly close to the sun um, when, when we practice it. Um, the shoulder, uh, I'm not actually sure how you would do it. Uh, that would be a great question for me to ask my other 
uh, fellow free scholars in the provost. Um, you might be able to get a pretty devastating throw uh, out of this one. I'm sure there's a way you could do it on the shoulder too, but we usually do it on the elbow. Um, yeah, and again, he says this is a play that cannot fail. Um, my read on that is it's a play that cannot fail in that, um, at least in the way that it's depicted, um, Fortitudo is uh, is taken away. Um, but once you've you know once you've when you once you're in this play once you've once it's started, um, it's uh, if it's in the right time, then it's difficult to stop. Unfortunately, the counter is the next play, <laughs> and it's a doozy of a counter. Um, all right, um, Zifeng, would you like to read the next one? Yep. yep. Sorry. There you go. Here is the counter I do to the play in which you try to break my arm over your shoulder. Thanks to its forcefulness, I'll throw you to the ground and then leave you for dead, so you'll never again do me or others wrong. I think maybe Fury thinks he's a superhero or something. He's, he says he says this sometimes, so that you, you'll never harm anyone else ever again. Da, 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 da. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. So here's the counter. Um, Basically, what what's happened is the scholar has um, stepped in to do the Santa sack, but the dagger person has seen it a mile away. So the dagger person has flipped their arm over and bent their arm. So their arm is now it's going to be a, a, at a low, um, a lower key or like a lower bent sort of position. And they've just. They're basically inflicting or insisting their structure on uh, the defender. The defender is in a very compromising position here. They can be the victim of a leg pickup. They can just be crushed under the weight of this this um, under kind of the yeah the weight of this position. This is a very shitty position, um, and the defender is going to be. They've turned their back to the enemy. That's one of the. That's one of the cardinal never in a million years would I ever be caught ever turning my back to my enemy for any reason. That's one of those things. Uh, this guy is, is in big, big trouble. Uh, yeah, so this can be countered pretty good. Um, the main takeaway about the Santa Sack is it, it's a play that works very well in the time that it works in. All right, you have to get it right. If you misjudge the timing, the action... You know the action. It's not sm it's not huge, but it's not super small either. And you you actually turn your back to the enemy effectively, so you have to get it right. Have to get it right. Uh, all right. Next one, the Fendente Disarm, what's affectionately known as the Fendente Disarm. Back at the top, Alex, would you like to read the text? I am well set to take your dagger away from you, and I'll give you an ascending thrust near your elbow. As soon as you let go of your dagger, I'll strike you with it. Since I was unable to bend your arm, this is the disarm I chose. Okay, cool. So this is called the Fendente Disarm because it's very similar to a disarm from the Fourth Remedy Master, um, where... Uh, Basically, you do you do something um, almost identical. Um, it's not obvious what this means. I'll, I'll give you an ascending thrust near your elbow. Um, the scholars kind of chewed on this a little, little bit and didn't really come to any serious conclusions. Um, so is, isn't that interesting, right? Um, as soon as you let your um, as you let go of your dagger, I'll strike you with it. Depending on the makeup of the dagger. Um, once you've disarmed it, it's possible to use it right away um, uh, with the blade or not. If the blade isn't um, sharp, some daggers have edges, some don't. Um, it's possible to stab them with the blade in your own hands, right, effectively. You could also use the rondelles to club the arm or the, the head or whatever. Um, and, you know, you could also break off the engagement, turn the dagger around, put it in your hand and attack him, right? So all that is great stuff. This disarm happens when, um, again, mostly from stay energies, most likely. And you're going to push that dagger point 
I'm going to push it to his wrist and 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 up. And this this defense, this first master cover, is just keeps the whole thing steady. And it'll just come right out of the hand. Um, since I was unable to bend your arm, this is the disarm I chose. So not only does this likely come from a stay energy because it's a disarm, but Fiora is also suggesting that even though... Well, it's not actually not obvious what this means. What this might mean is that this is best against an elongated straight arm. All right? Maybe that's what he means. It's also possible that he means that um, I was unable to bend your arm in any one of the keys or arm bending plays that we just saw. Right, so I chose this arm instead. I think it's the first, the former. I think it's against a long straight arm. The only problem is, of course, the image doesn't show a long straight arm. It shows the same kind of bent arm as before. So I don't know. But um, the disarm is pretty, pretty standard. Um, a lot of people get kind of frustrated with this one in class because they kind of, um, they uh, sometimes they uh, skin their own their own hand doing this. Uh, if you were wearing gloves, it wouldn't be an issue. And even if you wouldn't, it wouldn't be an issue because getting the dagger is better than uh, being murdered. So who cares? Um, all right. Moving on. The counter to this. Ah, oh, shit. They all have counters. Uh, Andrew, would you like to read this one? Here's the counter to the previous play to prevent you from disarming me. I'll cause you to let go of my dagger by pushing with my left hand. Then a few merciless thrusts will finish you off in agony. <laughs> you, just, you just can't help but putting that shit in there, right? Eh. All right. So the counter is exactly as we would expect. In this case, like I, I kind of prefaced before, the counter is not to the hilt, nor is it to the blade. It's to the offhand. But it's... You know, the offhand is is on the blade, so the counter to the offhand just make makes perfect sense. Okay, um, there's really not much to say about this that we haven't already said. It's the counter you would expect. So, so Aaron, can you, can you mm -hmm. clarify what's yep. happening, like uh, in in non Fiori language? Uh, sure, yeah, sure. So, um, w what's happening is, um, so the previous play we just saw, which is this one. So this scholar has attempted the disarm so he's made the cover he's attempting the disarm he's put his hand on the end of the of the dagger blade and he's going to be pushing the blood dagger blade towards the dagger man towards his elbow to take it from the hand and the counter is to for the for the for the attacker to put his hand on the opponent's offhand so when i say offhand Right. This is the this is the primary the hand the primary hand is doing the main thing, right? This is a very common uh, term in martial arts when you're when you're talking about what's going on in a in an engagement. You, usually, you talk about main hand and off hand. Um, when you have a when you're talking about weapons, the main hand is usually the hand that um, well, it's it's usually the hand that's holding the weapon. Right. Or in the case of a weapon uh, that you're using both hands with, the main hand would be the weapon. Uh, uh, sorry, the main hand would be the hand that's at the on the top. So if you're holding a longsword, for example, the main hand is the hand on top, and the off hand is the hand on bottom. The off hand can go or can go or stay. The main hand will stay. Will, will always stay there. Okay. Uh, in the case of a uh, of a a sword, for example. So in this case, the main hand is the left, and the off hand is um, the right for the defender. So the attacker here, he is bringing in his off hand, which is his left, to intercept the disarm. So this this this, this disarm can no longer be complete because the attacker is not going to let this blade travel up here. And, and be disarmed, he's going to, he's now locked this into one continuous structure. So he's got his hand on the dagger, um, the defender's got his hand on the wrist, and his hand on the blade, and he's got his hand on the enemy's wrist. So this is all one, one big structure. The difference is 
is that the attacker has the dagger. And it's very difficult for the defender to win these positions. This is a this is an un, uh, an un, non non desirable undesirable state of affairs for the defender, because now he's strength on strength, two hands on two hands, and the enemy is holding the object of leverage and is in controlling the deadly object. So another reason why these counters are great and easy. All they really need you to do is bring in your offhand. You're, you're in big trouble. Does that um, clarify things? Yep, thank you. Awesome. Uh, okay, great. So, the next one. The last scholar of the first Remedy Master. We made it, we're going to make it all the way through the first Remedy Master this time. That's great. 12 VD. Um, I will read this one. You won't be able to help falling completely to the ground, and you won't be able to perform any counter. I'll send your dagger far from you, or I'll be holding it rather than you, since I know this art and every deception it contains. Okay. What the hell happened here? <laughs> this is a great one, because on the face of it, you're like... Okay, so he looks... Something clearly happened. You know, either he his favorite song came on the radio at just the wrong moment, or someone did something to this guy that's making him reel back in inexplicable agony, such, <laughs> such that this guy is going for a leg pickup, and he's completely unmolested by this guy's offhand. So what the hell is going on here? Well, uh, who knows? But here's my theory. The theory is, uh, I think this is shared by, by some, the theory is that if we read, if we go right back to the start, if we read this first master defense as a strike, as coming with a strike, we can understand that the essence of this defense is not only the defense of the, of the, of the attack itself, but it is a strike that is brought in in single time to the defense, meaning that the moment of the defense will have a strike in it. So the defender is is doing two things at once, right? Or rather, they're just fighting with their whole body, right? Not only are they stepping forward on the on the moment of the defense, they have that rigid structure, but immediately this offhand strike is coming, okay? And if this dagger person wasn't expecting it, if they didn't have that offhand ready, if they weren't ready for really aggressive striking from the defender, if they were just trying to murder some poor sap, right? Then that action of making the defense and striking may in fact work. It might actually inflict pain or discomfort on the enemy. And it may even cause them to reel back. So one thing that dis what, that explains this picture, one theory that explains this picture, is the notion that from the cover, because this is a scholar, from the cover, he struck him, and this guy pulled back. So he struck him, followed the energy, without a pause, and he pulled back, got a bit of a leg pick up, and now he's going to throw his ass to the ground. Okay? Um... In that way, it makes sense. This play, you know, could also come from a myriad of other circumstances, you know, by wrestling through some of the other positions that we saw, you know, and, you know, things go wrong in Dagger. You get a strike off. Maybe he, you know, maybe he, he struck him in the balls or something, you know, anything. And that caused, that caused the opponent to fade back. On the dominant side, the Scholar's on. He's got that dagger. He's, he's never letting go of that dagger defense. On the dominant side, he gets a little uh, uh, a leg pick up, and sure enough, he gets a throw. Okay, so that's kind of what we're what we're looking at. Um, yeah. Okay. The only the only reason for this offhand to not be raining pain or really messing up this defense is some kind of pain compliance of some kind, right? Or, 
you know, maybe the dagger person really doesn't know what the hell he's doing and is only fighting with half his body. Who knows? But um, pain compliance is likely the reason that this uh, offhand is where it is. Okay? Um, you won't be able to perform any defense or counter. Well, circumstantially, where's the fortitudo? It's gone. So that makes sense. And I'll send your dagger far from you. Uh, once it's thrown, you can disarm it pretty easily. Uh, once you've thrown the person, you can disarm the dagger pretty easily. Um, and you can also keep the disarm. Um, this is actually a common uh, misconception um, among new students that when we throw people, we actually throw them away. But um, if we remember the master of uh, throws, the master of throws has the unfortunate victim at his feet. And this reminds us that we never, ever want to throw people away from us because when they're away, we can't continue to hurt them. <laughs> we want to throw them directly at our feet so that we can continue to control them and their weapon and we have the opportunity to inflict more pain on them if necessary. Okay, So in a case like this, the throw is going to be to the feet of the scholar just over here. And he's going to keep this dagger up. Any of you familiar with jujitsu um, or Muay Thai, you can think of um, different standing arm breaks that you can do against a person lying on the ground with you standing. Right? There's a bunch of different shit you can do. You can even do some high keys here, actually, um, from, standing, from a standing position against them with their, um, as they're lying down. So lots of interesting stuff. All right? And last but not least, the counter. Oh, shit. I'll read this one, too. Things don't always go as we say they would. <laughs> or I like the first trans the first uh, edition better. Things don't always go as we plan. Oof. I am the counter of the previous student, who is a giant fool. <laughs> I moved so well that he had to let go of my leg. And then a good thrust of the face will prove to all... What a dupe my opponent is. Wow. What a piece of text. All right. So this is the counter to the previous play we saw. Um, you know, he stepped in with a strike. Okay, maybe. Maybe it got blocked. Maybe he tried for a leg pickup. And the dagger attacker just withdrew the leg. Right? Withdrawing the leg on a leg pickup is going to be a standard, well, is a standard concept as a defense against leg pickups. And it's one that we're going to see um, in the sword section. Uh, although it's not a defense against the leg pickup, it's a defense against the leg strike. But uh, in the fourth scholar, the first master of the sword in two hands, folio 29, uh, 26 RC, we're going to see a uh, withdrawal of the lead leg. So in this case, in this case, this leg here was the lead leg, this right leg, and it was withdrawn against the leg attack. So in this case, um, the, uh, the the countermaster has withdrawn his lead leg where it was being picked up before, and now they're in this, you know, they're in this quote-unquote equal position, which would be uh, very equal were it grappling. The problem is... This is dagger, and there's still this dagger here. And so this is going to be one hell of a fight. But as long as the dagger person ha maintains control of the dagger, um, they're, they've got this supreme advantage. Okay? Um, there's a lot of, you know, bullshit in this text with giant fool, proof to a dupe, blah, 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 blah. This is probably one of the most important things in the dagger section, this little bit. Things don't always go as we plan. Um, in a way, we've, you know, we've heard this before in different words, but if there was one thing that was emblematic of the dagger section and of the nature of the dagger, other than, you know, his prefatory comments, it puts quick end to cruel combat, it's the most deadly weapons, blah, blah, blah. Things don't always go as we plan. That's dagger. That's, you know, that's my experience of dagger. That to every everyone I've ever talked to who's done dagger at full speed, that's their experience of it. It's just things don't always go as we plan. 
uh, and cir circumstantially, this is the final thought that Fiore kind of leaves us with at the end of the first Remedy Master of Dagger. So um, it is 10 o'clock. We actually made it through the whole first Remedy Master of Dagger. Um, this is the largest of the Remedy Masters, I believe, though some of the other ones come close. Um, there's a lot of counters here. And uh, yeah, we are on our way. Does anybody, uh, oh, um, before we continue, scholars that are still here, uh, Mike and Andrew, do you have anything to add or subtract? No, that uh, was pretty good to me. Matter of fact, it's pretty much in line with the stuff we were covering in the scholar sessions. So, cool. Yep. For Mike. the uh, struggling, uh, I don't know who said. Oh, it's like a, in a movie scene where it's super dramatic oh, yeah. and you have the dagger over the person you're struggling against them. Um, uh, some extra lines for that. Yeah. Uh, who does number two work for? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who is your father now? Yeah. Uh, that's a that's a good one. Kind of Saving Private Ryan esque for those of you who know that. Uh, that's one scene there. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you guys. Um, yeah, thanks, does anybody sir. have any other questions um, that they wanted to ask about what we've covered today? Any uh, or or anything else that uh, we may have covered in previous uh, sessions before we uh, leave for the evening? Um, oh, before when you said, uh, yep. uh, what was it? You said, when we come to grips with these weapons in grappling, were you making a pun on purpose? Oh, uh, um, yes. It was all <laughs> planned. <laughs> uh, yeah, probably not. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, all right. Okay, great. So um, I will put this up on YouTube as uh, I'm doing now. Uh, thank you guys all very much for coming. We have the next couple Remedy Masters to go in the next session. We'll probably get through um, two and three, maybe four um, in the next session. And uh, yeah, everybody stay healthy um, and, uh, and safe. And we'll see you next uh, Monday. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Aaron. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks. Have a good night, Aaron. Have a great night. Thanks, Aaron. Night.